This weird looking creature is a homunculus, and it is an official drawing neuroscientists use to show how the brain sees your body. In your brain there are two important strips of tissue. One handles sensation. This is the sensory cortex. The other handles movement. This is the motor cortex. The more sensation or control a body part has, the more space it takes up in the brain. Take the spine or toes as examples. You don't have fine, precise control over most of your back muscles, or the exact movement of your toes the way you do with fingers or lips. While footballers and pianists have an exquisite precision over their feet and fingers. So imagine making a similar map, but of a different hierarchy. If we drew a awareness homunculus, it would be an enormous head, swollen with thought. In fact, the head would be the only thing visible in the picture. The rest of the body would fade into abstraction. Thin limbs, carrying the head from place to place. A chest barely registering breath. A stomach acknowledged only when it protests. If you track a normal day honestly, you start noticing how little of it actually lands in the world. You wake up and the head turns on before the body. Depending on the study, people spend roughly a third to half of their waking hours thinking about something other than what they are doing. That number sounds abstract until you feel it. It means large sections of your life occur while you are mentally absent from your own movements. You are physically present and cognitively elsewhere. The bad news is, most of this thinking is not creative or philosophical. It's maintenance chatter. Self-commentary layered on top of experience like subtitles no one asked for. The head keeps talking because it learned that talking equals control. Silence feels risky. Presence feels inefficient. What's striking is how automatic it is. The mind doesn't ask permission before it hijacks attention. It fills gaps instantly. Waiting in line becomes a planning session. Showering becomes an argument. Eating becomes a revisiting old convo with a friend. The body performs the task while the head narrates a parallel life. At the end of the day, people feel tired without knowing why. This exhaustion didn't come from action. It came from constant internal motion. This is why days blur. Memory forms where attention lives. When attention stays trapped in thought, lived time thins out. You remember conclusions instead of moments. Living in the head feels normal because almost everyone around you is doing it too. But it's a peculiar way to exist, spending most of your life thinking about life instead of being inside it. The body moves through hours like a courier delivering consciousness from one thought to the next. And somewhere in that routine, whole days pass without ever fully arriving. If you listen closely to the content of your thinking, a pattern appears that feels almost embarrassing in its simplicity. The mind does not roam freely across time. It paces between two fenced areas, what already happened and what has not happened yet. Past and future take turns occupying the mental stage, and the present gets treated like a hallway people walk through without stopping. The past shows up as replay. Scenes return with edits. Things you said acquire better timing. Things you did gain alternative endings. What's rarely noticed is how little neutral thinking exists. Thought is not evenly distributed across time. It clusters around emotionally charged points. Some of these points are represented by certain individuals in our life. This is why people can spend hours thinking and yet feel untouched by the day itself. They weren't thinking about what was happening. They were visiting archives or drafting scripts. The nervous system experiences this as inner movement without arrival. Living in the head aligns with what phenomenologists quietly pointed at. Overrepresentation. Consciousness stops being a window and becomes a mirror. Instead of reality presenting itself and thought responding, thought precedes reality and filters it in advance. 
From existential philosophy, head living is temporal displacement. Sartre noted that humans suffer because consciousness is almost always ahead of itself. You live slightly in the future, defining yourself by what you are about to be, rather than what you are enacting. The head becomes a projection machine. Getting out of it happens when action collapses the distance between intention and execution. Doing precedes explaining. Identity stops being planned and starts being enacted. From Jungian and post-Jungian thought, living in the head is ego hypertrophy. The ego inflates to manage uncertainty and becomes a tyrant that overnarrates. Meanwhile, the unconscious continues operating through body symptoms, dreams, compulsions. Getting out of the head is a descent. Attention sinks downward. Existentially, living in the head means living ahead of your own existence. When someone lives this way, action loses density. You don't do things so much as you prepare to be the kind of person who does them. Kierkegaard noticed the same fracture from another angle. He described despair as living in a relationship with a self that has not yet arrived. A person becomes obsessed with who they should be, who they are becoming, who they are meant to be. Life turns into a corridor leading to a room that never quite opens. Head living thrives here because thought loves potential. Potential flatters the ego. Everybody is happy, and nobody is happy. Getting out of the head happens at when intention no longer precedes life. You commit without waiting to feel certain. Sartre insisted that essence follows existence, not the other way around. Identity is not discovered in thought. It is forged in behavior. There is a rare unsettling relief in this shift. Mistakes land fully. Success feels real. Regret becomes concrete instead of theoretical. You stop asking, who am I becoming? And start answering the quieter, harder question, what am I doing right now with what is in front of me? This is why existentialists distrusted excessive introspection. Too much self-observation turns life into an object instead of an event. Merleau-Ponty pushed this further arguing that consciousness is not something you have, but something you do, through the body, in the world. When thought dominates, the body becomes a prop. When action leads, the body becomes the site of truth. So, head living is so much more than just overthinking. It is postponing existence. To let the future stop supervising the present. To stop living slightly ahead of yourself. And finally, arrive where your feet already are. Consciousness was meant to function as a clearing, a space where the world shows itself. When it shifts into over-representation, that clearing fills up. Experience arrives already named. And you do not meet the thing itself, you meet your idea of it. The window turns into a mirror. Living in the head reflects a breakdown in distributed intelligence. The body houses multiple semi-autonomous decision systems, gut, immune response, hormonal signaling, posture. Modern humans over-centralize decision-making in the cortex. Getting out of the head restores multi-site intelligence. Biologically, the idea that you live in your head is a historical accident. The human organism evolved as a distributed decision system, long before the cortex learned to narrate experience. For most of evolutionary time, survival depended on signals that never passed through the conscious thought at all. Muscles tightened before danger was named. Digestion slowed before fear was recognized. Intelligence moved through the whole body. The gut alone carries its own nervous system, with more neurons than the spinal cord. Posture constantly adjusts based on perceived threat and social hierarchy shaping mood and confidence before any belief forms. Hormones broadcast long-term priorities on time scales, far slower and wiser than mental urgency. The immune system remembers, encounters, distinguishes self from foreign, 
and decides where energy should go. None of these systems wait for permission from the cortex. Modern life trains the opposite arrangement. Decisions get routed upward, verbalized, and justified. So what happens is that cortex becomes a bureaucratic bottleneck. Signals must pass through language before action occurs. Hunger becomes, I should eat later. Fatigue becomes, I need to push through. Tension becomes, I'm overreacting. The body keeps sending data, but the head edits it into something socially acceptable or strategically convenient. To many of us, this editing feels like intelligence, but very often, it is actually just basic suppression. When we speak about getting out of our head, what we are describing biologically is a reactivation of these silenced systems. You move away from a room without knowing why. You start or stop a conversation. You rest because your body tells you exactly what it needs and when and not because you've earned it. These signals feel irrational only because the cortex has forgotten how much authority it once shared with other systems. This return to distributed intelligence changes our behavior in subtle ways. Timing improves, most decisions become faster and quieter. You don't weigh options endlessly, which is such a relief. The moments like that feel grounding and even euphoric. Living in the head, we can even say, is a biological misallocation of authority. One subsystem took over the microphone and never gave it back. Getting out of the head is not done by shushing thoughts. I think this is obvious by now. The organism becomes a council again, instead of a monarchy. People say they are anxious, distracted, disconnected, but what they often mean is that their awareness rarely descends below the neck. To step out of the head requires something simple and startling. Contact with the world through sensation or action. Both routes operate like exits from a psychological maze. The first route toward presence comes through the body's sensory gates. A person touches a cold glass of water, feels its temperature travel through the palm, and the mind's spiral loosens. Someone steps outside and allows their attention to settle on the pattern of sunlight across a wall, and suddenly thoughts lose their grip. This approach treats the body as an anchor. Sensation pulls attention downward, away from mental chatter and into the raw present. Runners know this feeling when the rhythm of feet on pavement pulls them back into themselves. Musicians feel it when vibration enters the fingertips. Even simple acts, a slow exhale, the texture of fabric against skin, the taste of something warm, create an immediate shift. This is how we reconnect with our body. The second route emerges through purposeful action. Movement breaks mental stagnation the way wind clears smoke. Doing something, anything, actually. Opening a window, making a phone call, washing dishes, stepping outside for five minutes, redirects the brain from analysis into engagement. Thought becomes energy that moves outward instead of swirling inward. People trapped in overthinking often rediscover clarity the moment they begin a task, any task. Action offers structure and some kind of rhythm with sequence. It tells the brain, we move forward now. This is why certain moments feel transformative. All these actions carry the weight of decision, and decision interrupts rumination. Action acts as a bridge between imagination and reality. Both routes, sensory presence and purposeful movement, offer an exit from the tight corridors of the mind. Together, they create a life lived through contact. Most people assume everyone talks to themselves internally, but psychology shows a wide spectrum. Some people have a loud internal narrator running a 24-7 commentary, while others experience almost no verbal inner speech at all. Inner life operates on a continuum. Some exist mainly in raw sensation and action, others in symbolic processing. Living in the head is a choice we rarely realize we make. It is a habitat more than a habit.
Your mind has endless energy to stay in thought because the vast machinery of flesh, organs, and reflexes hums along without needing you. But aren't you curious how balance feels? Intelligence is a distributed system that is not concentrated in your head.